A very good evening and welcome to the news tonight. We're in the next 30 minutes. I'll be getting you the day's top stories from India and across the world. I'm Tracy Shilchi and here are the headlines. Teachers and students gathered at Delhi court for JNUSU president's case hearing manhandled by alleged lawyers. Amid the clashes, Kanheya Kumar's remand is extended by two more days. BJP President Amit Shah accuses Rahul Gandhi of hobnobbing with anti-nationalists. The Congress Vice President hits back, saying that the ruling party has no right to question his patriotic credentials. Madras High Court judge takes on the Chief Justice of India and two Supreme Court justices after he is transferred to a Calcutta High Court and restrained from taking judicial work. Mysuru in Karnataka is the cleanest city in India, Thanbad in Jharkhand the dirtiest. Findings of the government's cleanliness survey. And Turkey continues shelling Kurdish units in northern Syria. Syria writes to the UN voicing concern, saying that the attacks violate its sovereignty. Top story this evening, the Jawaharlal Nehru University protests reverberated at the Patiala House Courts in Delhi today as the JNU Students Union President Kanhaya Kumar was produced in court. Now, even as the court extended his custody by two more days, students and teachers who reached there to so show their support were beaten up. Meanwhile, at JNU, the Vice Chancellor's appeal for calm also fell on deaf ears as students at the university went on strike, demanding Kumar's immediate release. The JNU protests reached the courts today as arrested JNUSU President Kanahiya Kumar was produced in Delhi's Patiala House Courts. But even before he got there, violence erupted in the court premises. Teachers and students of the university and even some journalists were attacked and threatened. A large group of lawyers were seen manhandling people while slogans of Long Live India and Down with JNU erupted in the background. These people, there are six, seven lawyers here who started lobbying people in, in, the, in the morning that Pakistani hai, maa behen ki galiyan dete rahe. We were not saying anything to them. We were, we were just ten people standing and waiting to see them. The protests are not going to be able to do it. are not going to be able to do it. Some journalists who were there to cover the court proceedings were also manhandled. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the university campus, students are on strike till Kumar is released. Even though the teachers have extended solidarity with the students over the issue, they have not joined the strike yet. <laughs> Vice Chancellor Jadesh Kumar has appealed to the students to not resort to strikes and protests so that academic functioning of the university is not hampered. As we have already mentioned in our press note, we stand by freedom of expression. Uh, the entire university community is behind me, teachers, karamcharis and students. We are uh, looking at the entire event. Our uh, uh, inquiry committee is looking it, into this. It is all of our responsibility to bring normalcy uh, so that we go on with our academic activities. The vice chancellor also denied teachers allegations that he had allowed police into the campus to arrest Kanahiya Kumar. Kumar was arrested on Friday for allegedly participating in the Afzal Guru event on February 9th in which anti-India slogans were allegedly raised. The left and other opposition parties like the Congress and the Aam Admi Party have called the sedition charge against Kanaya Kumar excessive and demanded the students' release. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. And in the middle of the protests at the JNU at the uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University, BJP Chief Amit Shah has accused Congress Vice President Rahul Gandhi of hobnobbing with anti-national elements. In a blog post, Shah also demanded an apology from Sonia Gandhi and Rahul Gandhi but the Congress party reacted sharply to that blog, rejecting allegations revel leveled at the Gandhis, even questioning Shah's credentials. BJP President Amit Shah jumped into the JNU protest cauldron on Monday. 
accusing the Congress party of hobnobbing with anti-nationalists. In a blog post on the party website, Shah specifically targets Rahul Gandhi, questioning the Congress vice president's visit to the campus. He asked several pointed questions of Rahul, including whether the Congress leader has lent his voice to separatists in the country and does he want another partition. In the blog, Amit Shah also targets left parties. He says that a progressive mindset cannot be equated with support for anti-national sentiments. देश की जमीन पर देश के किसी भी हिस्से पर इस तरह की देशद्रोही गतिविधियों को सहन नहीं करना चाहिए ना सहन किया जाएगा पार्टी के राष्ट्रीय उपाध्यक्ष श्री राहुल गांधी ने वहां जाकर जिस तरह से इस घटना का समर्थन किया वो इससे भी ज्यादा चिंता की बात है तो मैं कांग्रेस पार्टी से पूछना चाहता हूं कि इससे बड़ी देशद्रोह के लिए सबूत क्या हो सकती है जो ये नारे हैं Congress Vice President Rahul Gandhi reacted sharply to the criticism saying the ruling party has no right to question his patriotic credentials. Desh bhakti ka license ki dukaan khol rakhi hai RSS. Sirf wo keh sakte hain desh bhakt kaun hai, desh drohi kaun hai. Aur ye log hai kaun? Ye wohi log hai jinhone Gandhi ji ke seene mein teen goliyan mari thi. ये वही लोग हैं जो अंग्रेजों के सामने माफी मांगते थे द कांग्रेस टूट फॉर्मली बिहाइंड इट्स लीडर रिजेक्टिंग ऑल चार्जेस लेवल बाय अमित शाह महात्मा गांधी के विचारों के हत्यारों और गोडसे के विचारों के वंशजों से हमें या देश को राष्ट्र प्रेम और देशभक्ति का पाठ नहीं सीखना सबसे अधिक विडंबना पूर्ण यह है कि एक ऐसे व्यक्ति जो खुद माननीय उच्चतम न्यायालय द्वारा तड़ी पार कर दिए गए थे वो राष्ट्र प्रेम और देशभक्ति का पाठ भारतीय राष्ट्रीय कांग्रेस को पढ़ा रहे हैं कांग्रेस बीजेपी लेड एनडीए गवर्नमेंट ऑफ अंड्यू यूज ऑफ पुलिस फोर्स ऑन द जे एन यू कैंपस द रूलिंग पार्टी हैज टर्म कांग्रेस स्टैंड एज बींग सपोर्टिव ऑफ एंटी नेशनल एलिमेंट्स with Sham Sundar Vishal Dahiya Rajya Sabha TV Delhi Meanwhile CPM General Secretary Sitaram Yachuri has allegedly received threat calls over extending support to students who are protesting the arrest of the JNU Students Union President Kanhaiya Kumar a police complaint has been registered in this regard and a probe has been initiated by the Delhi police however no case has been registered as yet party sources claim that three threat calls were made at the party head office between 10:30 pm and 1 am last night Allegedly the callers were abusing the party general secretary over his support to the JNU issue. Meanwhile an FIR has been registered in connection with yesterday's attack on the CPM head office following which three of these youths were arrested. Yesterday they had allegedly tried to vandalize the party office. The youth had also told the police that they belonged to the Aam Aadmi Sena while the party alleged that the men belonged to the RSS. See, as per the information with us, the, the calls were received at the landline number of the CPM office. There were three calls made, and uh, the name of uh, uh, the leader, uh, Shri Sitaram Yachuri, was also taken by the caller. And uh, we have now got the written uh, complaint, and we will act legally. Well, amid all this chaos that's taking place in the national capital, let's not forget that just a week to go for the budget session of Parliament, and the Prime Minister has convened a meeting of floor leaders of all parties in both houses of Parliament on Tuesday. The meeting assumes significance amidst growing hostilities between the ruling and the opposition parties on several issues, with not much legislative business taken up due to disruption in the previous two sessions. The government is making a fresh bid to ensure smooth functioning this time around. The government also saying that it's not an all-party meeting, and the bills it seeks to introduce or pass will not be discussed. Meanwhile, Congress Vice President Rahul Gandhi embarked on a two-day visit to poll-bound Assam, aiming to retain power for the fourth consecutive time. Rahul Gandhi officially launched the Congress's election campaign in the state. He addressed a public meeting at Jorhat, the constituency represented by Chief Minister Tarun Gogoi and also Bhipura. Now, while addressing rallies, Rahul hit out at the BJP and accused the party of spreading hatred. 
He also hailed his party of doing a commendable job in the state for the last 15 years. During his two-day visit, Rahul is also expected to interact with leaders of the tea garden laborers community and will hold a padhyatra in Shiv Sagar district on Tuesday. 2014 में जब चुनाव था लोकसभा का तो आपको याद होगा कि प्रधानमंत्री जी आए थे और उन्होंने आपसे वायदे किए कहा था 15 लाख रुपए हम हर बैंक अकाउंट में डालेंगे मैं आपसे सवाल पूछना चाहता हूं यहां कोई एक व्यक्ति है जिसके बैंक अकाउंट में मोदी जी ने 15 लाख रुपए डाल के दिखाए तो जहां भी युवा आरएसएस के खिलाफ बोलता है उनकी विचारधारा के खिलाफ बोलता है उसे वो कहते हैं ये देशद्रोही है देशभक्ति का लाइसेंस की दुकान खोल रखी है आरएसएस ने सिर्फ वो कह सकते हैं देशभक्त कौन है देशद्रोही कौन है a dissident Congress leader, Kaliko Pool, has a state claim to form the next government in Arunachal Pradesh. Pool submitted a memorandum to Governor Jyoti Prasad Rajkhoa. 19 Congress assemblies, along with 11 BGP legislators and two independent members, also submitted a separate memorandum to the governor, reaffirming their support to Pool. The governor has assured them of uh, putting forward their claims to the president, who will decide when to lift the president's rule in the state. BJP MLA has also made it clear that the party would be supporting a Congress government led by Pool as the leader and had no intention to form a BJP-led government in the state. The Supreme Court is currently considering pleas against imposition of the President's rule in the state. The court is also hearing petitions seeking examination of the discretionary powers of the governor. Justice C.S. Karanan of the Madras High Court has said that he will order registration of FIR against two judges of the Supreme Court under the SEST Act. Justice Karnan's action comes after he was restrained by the two-judge bench from taking judicial work. In his defense, he says that only allocation of judicial work has been stopped, but his judicial powers were intact. Earlier, Justice Karnan had stayed the Chief Justice of India's order as well, transferring him to the Calcutta High Court. He also directed the CGI to file a written statement though his through his subordinates, explaining the reason for transferring Justice Karnan by the 29th of February 2016. The development is not only unprecedented in the Indian judiciary, but also a blow to institutional esteem. The Indian Army's plan to, to place younger officers in charge of combat has been cleared by the Supreme Court. The Army's command and exit policy that was introduced in 2009 was rejected last year by the Armed Forces Tribunal, but the Supreme Court on Monday reversed that decision. While delivering the verdict, the Apex Court asked the government to create 141 additional vacancies for promotion of combat unit officers. In 1999, the Army's response during the Kargil War was termed sluggish in a report by a government-appointed committee. The Ajay Vikram Singh Committee concluded that colonels and brigadiers need to be younger to efficiently lead the Army during wars. The report also pointed out that the average age of a colonel leading an Indian combat unit was 41, while it was 37 for the armies of Pakistan and China. The policy was challenged by some officers who argued that many senior officers uh, would have to forego promotions and be overtaken by junior officers. He also claimed that the policy was skewed in favour of the artillery and infantry arms by giving them more vacancies for promotions. All right, on to another one of our headline stories. And Mysuru city in Karnataka has been ranked the cleanest in the country in the government's Swachh Sarvekshan or Cleanliness Survey 2016. It had also won the title last year. In fact, Mysuru tops the list of 73 cities that were surveyed this year. They included 22 state capitals. Cities with a population of over 10 lakh were eligible. The city of palaces was also ranked first in a list of 476 cities last year. Besides Mysuru, in the top four this year are Chandigarh, Tiruchirappalli, Ain Tamil Nadu and Central New Delhi called the National Capital Territory. Now at the bottom of this list of 73 are Patna in Bihar, ranked 70th, followed by Itanagar in Arunachal Pradesh, Asansol in West Bengal and at the last place Dhanbad in Jharkhand. Prime Minister Narendra Modi's own Lok Sabha constituency, Varanasi too, fared badly coming it at a, coming in at a poor 65th.
All right, with that, a quick break here. We'll be back with the international news in a bit. Stay with us. Tales that inspire. Stories of social change. A salute to diversity. Promoting public discourse. Events that motivate. Inspiring the innovative spirit. Watch Rajya Sabha television documentaries. Mondays, Tuesdays and Wednesdays at 10.30 p.m. Welcome back to the news tonight. Let's get you some financial news now. And reversing, in fact, uh, four months of rising trend, the WPI inflation fell to minus 0.9% in January as food articles, mainly vegetables and pulses, turned cheaper. The wholesale price index-based inflation was minus 0.73% in December. In January 2015, it was minus 0.95%. This is the 15th straight month since November 2014 that deflationary pressure persisted and wholesale inflation remained in the negative zone. Food inflation stood at 6.02% in January as against 8.17% in December, according to the official data released today. And India's export in January dipped to 13.6% for the 14th straight month to 21 billion US dollars due to a steep fall in shipment of petroleum products and engineering goods. Imports too shrank 11% to 28.71 billion US dollars last month, leaving a trade deficit of 7.63 billion US dollars as against 7.87 billion US dollars in the same month last year. It is the lowest deficit in 11 months. While gold imports shot, by, shot up by 85.16% last month to 2.91 billion US dollars, overseas shipments of petroleum products shrank 35.18% to 1.95 billion US dollars in January, while uh, the decline of 27.6% to 4.98 million was seen in engineering goods. All right, now in two weeks from now, Finance Minister Arun Jaitley will present the Union Budget 2016. Different groups have different expectations from this year's budget. And starting today, we're bringing you the budget expectations of different stakeholders. Today, we're taking a look at, look at the rural sector in a bid to drive rural consumption and assuage distress in the agriculture sector. The Finance Minister is expected to give budgetary push to programs on irrigation and rural roads. The focus on agriculture assumes importance as farmers across the country have suffered a drought on one hand and unseasonally heavy rainfall on the other, severely impacting rural income and consumption. Two consecutive deficient monsoons, a global crash in commodity prices, and the agriculture sector that provides employment to more than 60% of the country's population has taken a hit. With an eye on improving farm productivity, the government allocated 50,000 crore rupees over five years under the Pradhan Mantri Krishi Sinchai Yojana in July 2015. However, experts feel that efforts need to be bolstered to extend irrigation facilities to all farmers. Of the 142 million hectares of land used for cultivation, currently only 45% is under irrigation. Clearly, a push is needed. Watershed management has been more money on that. 1 million tanks, storage tanks, micro-irrigation systems, infrastructure lending status. In that way, when you go to the market, we talked about price deficiency payment. Better access to roads in rural areas is also critical to raising agricultural productivity. It is expected that allocation to the Pradhan Mantri Gram Sadak Yojana could be maintained at the 15,000 crore rupees sanctioned for 2015-16 or enhanced with a definite objective of connecting all rural habitations with all weather roads by March 2019. Transport Minister Nitin Gadkari has sought a record 70,000 crore rupees to boost road construction and spur economic growth. One needs the rural road connectivity as a, as a more urgent 
uh, requirement. With the highways, the, the, although uh, the highway construction and the money that's been pumped into it, it's been largely uh, responsible for the increase in public investment this year, which in turn has driven economic growth. The crop insurance scheme could also get a leg up, with the Prime Minister already pitching for efforts to spread awareness about the Pradhan Mantri Fasal Bima Yojana. Enumerating the setbacks that have hit the agriculture sector in the last couple of years, all eyes are set on what reforms and policies Budget 2016 would bring in for the farm sector. This is Kriti Mishra's report for Rajya Sabha TV. All right, let's head on to some international news now. In a cessation of hostilities in Syria looks a far cry yet, despite world powers agreeing to just that last week. Turkey continues shelling on the north of the country against advancing Kurdish militants. The airstrikes have added to an already complicated situation where regime forces have been making significant advances with backing from Russian airstrikes. Differences with the US-led coalition have also come to fall. Hopes of the much-celebrated cessation of hostilities in Syria grow lighter by the day. Both Turkish and Russian airstrikes continue unabated. Turkey against Kurdish militia in Aleppo, Russia against rebel targets. Damascus raising protests with the United Nations, calling it a violation of sovereignty has not helped either. It also accused Turkey of allowing its soldiers to cross into Syria, a charge Turkey denies. Ankara says its shelling is justified as Kurdish militia in Syria was allied to the outlawed PKK, which has carried out a campaign for autonomy in Turkey. Ayrıca bu saldırılar esnasında da sınırlarımıza da yönelik tacizler oldu. Yani angajman kurallarını işletmemiz gereken bir durum ortaya çıktı. Ve daha önce aldığımız kararlar mı ilginç? Gerek Türkiye dönüş mülteci akınına izin vermemek. The Munich conference that threw up hopes of a cessation of hostilities ended on Sunday with no consensus on just how. While Washington has been working closely with Kurdish forces in northern Syria, Moscow is launching airstrikes in support of President Bashar al-Assad. World powers concede that it will take time before stability can return to the war-ravaged country. Mr. Putin is not interested in being our partner. He wants to shore up the Assad regime. He wants to re-establish Russia as a major power in the Middle East. He wants to use Syria as a live fire exercise for Russia's modernizing military. Если он хочет получить там длительную войну, то, конечно, можно устраивать и наземные операции, и все остальное. Но не надо никого пугать. Надо договариваться в том ключе, в котором они вели разговор с министром Лавровым. Close to five years of intense war in Syria between multiple internal players and international coalitions has killed more than 2,50,000 people, displaced 11 million and created an unprecedented refugee situation in Europe. And a dawn still looks further away than ever. Bureau Report, Raja Sabha TV. And in related news, U.S. President Barack Obama has urged Russian President Vladimir Putin to end his air campaign against Syrian opposition forces. Obama said this to Putin during a phone call. The White House said that during the phone call, Obama stressed the importance of rapidly implementing humanitarian access to besieged areas of Syria and initiating a nationwide cessation of hostilities. The serious situation has driven relations between the U.S. and Russia to new laws. Ties were already strained by Putin's support for Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. Russia entered the Syria conflict in September, launching airstrikes on forces aligned against Assad. U.S. says that Putin is desperate to keep Assad in power since Russia's sole remaining military base in the Middle East lies near Syria's Mediterranean coast. With that, let's take you through some more international news updates in Global Buzz. South Korea said on Monday that the country should have nuclear weapons as concerns of a rising tensions with North Korea looms ahead of the parliamentary polls in April. Opposition liberals have blamed President Park for lacking a clear strategy to deal with the North, which recently tested its fourth nuclear device. Pakistan's Bacha Khan University reopened on Monday, guarded by hundreds of policemen. The university suffered a deadly assault in which 21 people were killed last month. In fact, the attack has spurred the debate on arming teachers in Pakistan once more.
A 5.7 magnitude earthquake struck near Christchurch, New Zealand yesterday. The quake had more than 40 aftershocks. Police said that there were no reports of major damage or serious injuries, but people were evacuated from several buildings and there were reports of some liquefaction. In fact, amateur video capture the moments a cliff collapsed into the sea below on Sunday. The UN reported that the civilian casualties of the war in Afghanistan has risen to record levels for the seventh year in a row. Violence continues to spread across the country in the wake of the withdrawal of most international troops. At least 7,457 were injured by gunfighting last year, uh, the international organization said in its annual report. And now let's change tracks, get you all the latest from the world of sports in sports. London Olympics bronze medalist Mary Combe has expressed concern about the administrative logjam in Indian boxing. The five-time champion Mary Combe today said that the future seems dark for the country's boxers who are losing motivation to train. India does not have a national federation after the International Boxing Association terminated the Boxing India last year. The sport is being administered currently by an ad hoc committee. Mary Combe hoped that the administrators would put their house in order before the Rio Olympics in August this year. Ahead of the 6th ICC T20 World Cup, West Indies batsman Darren Bravo has withdrawn from the team's T20 squad to concentrate on the longer forms of the game. The middle order batsman is the third man to withdraw from the squad with uh, Sunil Narayan and Kiran Pollard having pulled out of the original squad earlier. A replacement for the 27-year-old who has played 12 international 2020 matches is yet to be named while Ashley Nurse and Carlos Brathwaite have taken the places of Narayan and Pola. Barcelona maintain their grip on the Spanish title as Luis Suarez netted a hat-trick including an audacious penalty move with Lionel Messi to see off a spirited Celta Vigo 6-1. Messi's brilliant free kick opened the scoring at Camp Nou, but Chelta deservedly drew level before half-time to John Guidetti's penalty. However, Suarez took over the final half-hour as he swept home Messi's fine through ball and before prodding home that from point-blank range. And finally, the mortal remains of the nine Siachen Bravehearts who were bur buried alive on uh, the 3rd of February this year in an avalanche in the world's highest battlefield were brought in Delhi today before being flown to their respective states. Wreaths were laid at the Palam Airport in Delhi at a solemn ceremony led by the Indian Army Chief General Darbeer Singh. Here's a tribute to the Siachen Bravehearts. We leave you with this. <laughs> 